يا ربي صل على النبي على وال الحال رسول الله خير الانام واله يا ربي صل على النبي الغالي الغالي رسول الله خير الانام واله يا ربي صل على النبي والحق على تمسك بكتاب الله بسنه الرسول صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلاله على الخير ابتغاء وشلاء ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى ونويت ما نوى مشايخنا من صالح نيات ان الله تعالى يجعلنا من العلماء العاملين الفائزين بعلم يقين وعن يقين حقيقي لطف وعافيه اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد نورك الساري ومجدك الجاري واجمعني به في كل اطواري وعلى آله وصحبه يا نور الحمد لله إن شاء الله في continuation of our classes on Sirah we arrive at a great moment a great moment which is what the hijra of the Prophet himself صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم to an abode that thereafter is going to be known as Dar al-Hijra the abode of the hijra the abode of the flight of the messenger himself صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم it's a special place a place on which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had tread in those hearts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected to be the face victors. The protectors of the great Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Qanif also tread. The Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great Imams of the religion of Islam, Imam Malik ibn Anas radiallahu ta'ala an wa arda was known as the Imam of Darul Hijra. This is his title. He was known as the Imam of the abode of the flight, the place unto where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sahihi wa sallam migrated unto. This is known as Medina to Munawwara and it's also known as Tayyibah and it's also known as Taba, Taba from the names of the blessed place Taba. And that name Taba not only is the place of Medina, of Medina to Munawwara but in the tradition which is in Tabarani of Sayyidina Ka'b al-Ahbar it's also from the names of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi from the names of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his name is Taab, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as written in the books, in the ancient the books, the books of the Christians and the Jews, in what in previous the revelation. So this is a blessed place, and a sign, one of the greatest signs of how blessed the place is, unto which the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, makes flight, is that it's the very soil from which the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is crafted. And our belief of the people of Sunnah al Jama'ah is that the place where we are deposited, the place where we are placed six feet beneath the ground, when we eventually die, it's from that soil that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala crafted us from. Okay, so it's special soil. Prophet is created from the soil of Medina, he's not created from the soil of Mecca. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahibu sallama. Okay, and the people, traditionally those who have an affinity, a deep affinity, with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those of an intimacy with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they have a special affinity for and a special intimacy to or with that blessed place that is known as Medina Medina okay the most beloved place to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Medina Tul Manawara okay so we looked at the theme of the Hijrah and the nature of the Hijrah as we, we should have inshallah ta'ala ascertained in some of our first sessions which is the onset of prophecy, where the Prophet ﷺ, on the first engagement of Gabriel, we spoke about from knowledge to experience. I, the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ, that he was a prophet, is a knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ, has from more from the world of soul, the world of spirit. And it's a knowledge also that the Prophet ﷺ, has in his manifestation in the lower realm. I, a question many people will ask, did the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, no, he was a prophet prior to the first descent of Gabriel. And the answer is yes, he knew he was a prophet prior to the first descent of Gabriel. But, so then the question will be asked, well, what about the, the, the difficulties that the prophet saw from experiences upon the descent of Gabriel? So he goes down to the first comforter, Hussein Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, who then takes her to the second comforter, I'll point to note, Sayyidina Waraqa ibn Nawfal, rahimahullah ta'ala. So what is all that about? And that is from knowledge to experience. I knowing something is not necessarily like experiencing something. So here the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ of his prophecy is something which has taboot, no doubt, prior to war, that great day. 
inside of Rabi' al-Awwal, Rabi' al-Awwal, the month in which Gabriel visits the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the month in which we're, all, we're in at this point in time. Okay, but the experience now of prophecy, hatta balaghani al-jahal in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, until I reach the point like of no return, the point when I thought I would die, the difficulty of prophecy, as we learned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, never was I revealed unto, except that I believed I would die. Okay, so the experience of revelation, the experience of engaging the angelic force, the, enge- the experience of hatta, what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi until I experienced ja'ahu al-haqq, as Aisha says in Bukhari, until the real al-haqq, comes on to whom the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And if you want to get literal, you know, be literal, like a lot of people, you want to be literalists. But unfortunately, they're not literalists in the right one, in the right in places. Okay, so Ja'ul Haq, Al Haq, the literal meaning of Al Haq is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is Allah Jalla fil Ula. And this is the difficulty of revelation. Like, revelation is engaging what? Kalam Allah, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kalam Allah, which is a sifa azaliya, which is a pre eternal attribute of He subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point is, when he meets the second comforter, we call him the second comforter, who is that? Sayyidina Waraqib ibn Nawfal. Waraqib ibn Nawfal, who is the one, the cousin of Sayyidina Khadija. Waraqib ibn Nawfal ibn Asad ibn Abdul Uzza. He's the cousin of Sayyidina Khadija radiallahu ta'ala, anha, anha. Direct cousin. Okay, they share the same grandfather. And he is of those who in Sahih al-Bukhari, in the Hadith of Aisha, Tanasara fi Jahiliya, that he was of those who were, became Christian in Jahiliya, in the age of wanton um, anger, wanton rage, pre-Islamic era, became Christian. When he traveled Arabia to the Levant, he became a great Hanif, whose name is Sayyidina Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal. Sayyidina Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal is the great Hanif. The one Imam al-Bukhari has an entire chapter about him inside of the Sahih. The father of the great Sa'id ibn Zayd, one of the ten people who guaranteed paradise. So Husayn Zayd bin Nawfal, bin Amr bin Nawfal, and Waraqa ibn Nawfal, they travel Arabia to the level of northern Arabia in search of the religion of Ibrahim. After Sayyidina Waraqa, Tanassar. Sayyidina Waraqa becomes what Christian, on the last Christians alive, true Christians, monotheistic Christians, as to Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal, he says, this is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the original way of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the higher way. Sayyidina Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal. So he leaves, okay, and he's the greater of the two, according to our tradition. Okay, Sayyidina Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal. But Waraka becomes Christian, and he's going to be of those who has very in-depth knowledge of what, of the nature of the prophecy, the nature of the higher realm, the angelic realm. And the nature of prophecies, how the whole thing plays out. So when the Prophet وسلم, goes on the advice of Khadija and sits with Waraqa ibn Nawfal after the first descent of Gabriel, and Waraqa begins to explain to the Prophet وسلم, some of that which he's experienced from amongst them who Gabriel is. He calls him the supreme bearer of the heavenly secret. And, 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 that there are bearers of the, of the heavenly secret, bearers of revelation. Bearers of the secrets of divine, but this is the supreme wa angel who descended upon you. And the ala Musa, the one who used to descend upon Moses. Which your ulama says, Shuf, look, listen to what the precision of Sayyidina Waraqa ibn Nawfal, that he's a Christian. Why would he say the one who used to descend upon Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus? No, but he says, Moses, why? In knowledge of the fact that after the Prophet, who has 124,000 engagements with Gabriel. 124,000 times the Prophet engages the, the great Namus, Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam. After the Prophet وسلم, comes Musa. Musa is the second Prophet in relation to engagement with Gabriel. And that's why Waraq ibn Nawfal singled out Moses over whom? Jesus, his Prophet, he's following Jesus because he's Tanasara, he's a Christian. And the point about this is showing you the precision of this individual known, is known as Waraq ibn Nawfal. And then he tells the Prophet ﷺ about our topic, which is Hijrah. He says that, Would that I have strength on the day when your people throw you out, so I can be of those who protect you, those who save you. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah mukhriji ahum. You see, they're going to cast me out, they're going to throw me out of Mecca. La uqusimu bihada al-balad, wa anta hillun. Uh, I swear 
by this land that you are a legal citizen in this land. That's Rabbul Izzah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're going to throw me out. Sayyidina so Warqa says, never has a Prophet come with the like of what you have came with, except that his people have cast him out. And that's the declaration of Hijrah. And from the first engagement of Gabriel, the reality of Hijrah is going to be a more mentioned to the Prophet ﷺ on the tongue of Sayyidina Waraka ibn Nawfal, who's going to die soon after. Die soon after. A blessed person who understood the nature of blessed space because the topic of Hijrah is ultimately about blessed space. The blessed space of Medina to Manawar in which the Prophet ﷺ occupies, and by virtue of his occupation of that space, that space becomes blessed. So in the Waraka ibn Nawfal, soon after the engagement with the Prophet ﷺ, he passes by the Kaaba. And in the Kaaba, by the besides the Kaaba, he sees Sayyidina Bilal al Habashi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Bilal al Habashi is being tortured at the Kaaba by Umayyah, Ahad, Ahad, Ahadun, Ahad. Ah, declaring one, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would later ask Sayyidina Bilal, why did you say Ahadun, Ahad? Where did you get that from? It's a bid'ah. Ah? Where did you get the Ahadun, Ahad? Nobody else taught you that. Prophet never taught you that. And he said that, what? Well, if I knew a better way to say, I would have said it. And that was the first thing that came to my mind was Ahad and Ahad. Waraqa ibn Nawfal, he sees Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu ta'ala an wa arda, and he says to Sayyidina Bilal, Uth but ya Bilal, be firm beneath this punishment. He said, by Allah, wallah, by Allah, if you die in this place, I will take this place as a place of worship. Waraqa ibn Nawfal says to Bilal, I will worship Allah upon the place in which you die. Okay, that's the mufhum of the nature of blessed places. Because what is the place upon which Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu ta'ala is being tortured? It's the place of the ascension of Sayyidina Bilal unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's rifaq with darajat being raised unto Allah ta'ala in degrees. And after one of our teachers, may Allah ta'ala preserve him, he said, sure, look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is Umayyah? Who is Umayyah? He said, Umayyah is a subjugated slave whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to raise his slave, Bilal, unto him, radiallahu ta'ala an warda. That's the scheme when you gaze with the eye, the eye of what? The eye of sanctity, the eye of purity. Don't believe that Bilal is being tortured. Just believe Bilal is being purified and raised unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in degrees. But look at the mafhum of the shaykh. That's what the Prophet used to call waraka, the shaykh. Look at the mafhum. Look how we understood the nature of what? Of the sanctity of place. And place being sanctified due to what? Blessed, purified beings being treading upon that type of air. That's somebody of Jannah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ra'aytu Shaykh to Jannah. I saw the Shaykh in paradise. Warqa ibn Nawfal. Rahimahullah ta'ala. So the Hijrah is a very blessed occasion. And when we see that Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, Rahimahullah ta'ala, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, who is going to reset time, restart the clock, and he has many what events, great events by which he could restart the clock onto. Could have chose the time that the Prophet ﷺ first descended, the great ruh of the Prophet ﷺ descends into what the womb of Sayyidina Amin Abid Wa'a, the what the mother of the Prophet ﷺ. Thomas opinion, Rajab, in the one, the blessed month of Rajab, is the descent of the great soul of the Prophet ﷺ, which Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah al Hanbali, he said that the ruh, the soul of the Prophet ﷺ, is the size of the entire cosmos. Ibn Khaim Hujo Ziyar Himawullah Ta'ala says, that soul 120 days inside of the womb of Amin Abid Dwahab descends, what? Descends and connects to that great and perfect form that we read in the likes of the books of Shamayab that is being crafted and formed inside of a blessed womb, a blessed space, rendered blessed by the presence of a blessed being, Khalqan wa Khuluqa. Outward manifested, manifested form, as well as what the inward reality of the soul of the Prophet. That would be a befitting moment to say, let us reset the clock to the time of the descent of the great soul. Or let us reset the clock to the time in which what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to place, place what the actual what form inside of the womb, which is Raja. Three, three months, um, four months later, is going to be what? The descent of the soul, Hul Ka'ida. Or it could have been inside of the blessed month of what? Well, of Rabi al Awwal. Am al Fiyr. Dominant opinion. That's when the Prophet ﷺ comes into the world, manifests in the world. The Prophet ﷺ comes into the world in sujood. 
prostrate declaration to what? To the cosmos of his Oedipus, Rububiyya Lillah, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet sallallahu who then raises his eyes towards the heavens. So there's what? There's no, no mistake about Rububiyya Liman. Worship whom? Now worship the gods that are 360 idols that are what? Are surround the Kaaba. But it's worship of Rabbul Izzah, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he takes, he clasps the earth in order to show his dominion. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Allah is going to grant him dominion over the entire planet Earth. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A befitting moment by which we can walk, we can, we can measure time from. Okay? What about the descent of Gabriel? What about the great union, the marriage between the Prophet وسلم, and Khadijah? The greatest union in the history of the cosmos, history of the cosmos, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying the Khadija to Kubra, Rabbi Allah Taala Anha wa Arda, descent of Gabriel, Rabbi Al Awwal, Hadith Al Bukhari, yani yani Allah abba'athu Allah wa ala raksi arba'ina sana, Allah Taala grants him prophecy on his what fortieth birthday, Rabbi Al Awwal. Could have been a, another time that Sayyid Umar ibn Khattab could have did it from. What about some of the great occasions of the Prophet Sallallahu What about the Isra al-Mi'raj? Yani, in the history of the universe, it's never been said, as one of the poets said, that Jibreel was left standing. <laughs> Jibreel. As the Prophet Sallallahu Araj, ascended beyond the Sidrat al Muntaha. The great Gabriel, who has freedom to roam the entire cosmos, except this is beyond the cosmos. This is Hadratul Ilahiyya, that the Prophet ﷺ was summoned unto, whilst Jibreel was left standing at the Sidratul Muntaha. Yeah, if I was to go past this point, I would self combust, I would be sent into oblivion. And you can't even imagine that moment when the Prophet ﷺ stands in front of Rabbul Izza. Nobody has ever had that. Sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wake state. Great soul is able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't understand that moment. That would have been a befitting time huh, for some of us by which to measure time from. And we could go on. What about Badr, great Badr, with the great angels, Jibreel, leads what hordes of angels in order to fight in, in the lower realm. What about Uhud in and of itself? What about the great battle of Khandaq, the other great battles? What about Fatah Mecca? What about Hudaybiyan, Fatahna, Laka Fatahan, Mubina? Great moments the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. I mean, the reality of anybody who has an inkling of knowledge about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every single moment is great. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab could have chose any single moment in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by which to restart the clock, by which to measure time. But he chose the Hijrah. He chose the Hijrah. And this is Arab al-Arab, the way of the Arabs, that were the great events they would use as well as a starting point for time. So before that moment, everything was measured by great events. And the greatest event in the mind of the Arab psyche of the Arabs was the fear, the destruction of the rise of the element, which we clearly mentioned inside of the Quran. You see, that's for people who look with that eye. And it's not a coincidence that the Prophet Sallallahu was born in the same year. So is it the year of the field, or is it the year of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the great bear? Perspectives. And one of the things that religion, inshallah ta'ala, should what render each and every single one of us is of those who see the world from the perspective of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Central, central to how we see the world. Central to how we view ourselves, central to how we view others, central to how we view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, central to how we act, central to how we refrain, central to how we sleep, central to how we wake, drink, walk, etc. Central to every single moment. That's the meaning of those who are Muhammadi, those people who are who have truly attached to the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Look at the tradition, sahih. And when they gazed at the Prophet Sallallahu or somebody who went to see the Prophet Sallallahu they could not distinguish him from his companions. Now, what is that? Mirrors of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Understand the hadith of Mufhumihi, that what they're seeing is the what, reflections of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi inside of all of those companions who surrounded the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the meaning of Muhammadi. You see, people who embrace the mirror al-mu'min, mir'at al-mu'min, al-mu'min. Who's al-mu'min? The Prophet sallallahu The believer is the mirror of al-mu'min, ay kul mu'min, of all believers, of all believers, sallallahu alayhi When last did we engage or gaze in the mirror of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 
This time in which we are in, like the month of Rabi al Awwal, is one of the times when we should take stock of ourselves, reflect over our realities, reflect over our relationship with the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, and reflect over the Messenger, inshallah ta'ala. And no doubt whatsoever, the great uh, discipline of Sirah is one of the means by which we walk, we can reflect over the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. The flight unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the flight unto the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the great moment of the Hijrah, moment of the Hijrah. And the arrival of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is likewise inside of this blessed month. That's the grandness of what? Of Rabi al awwal you see, the grandness of Ramadan cave, what's the grandness of Ramadan? No doubt, Nas. It's the month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran. Revealed the Quran. But revealed the Quran unto whom? Not unto the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the outward. In the hadith of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, if you looked at, it's the Quran being revealed unto what? Kiraman Barra. The angels of what? Of the first heaven who surround Baytul Izzah, the, the mighty house of the first heaven, the Kaaba of the first heaven. That's where the Quran is revealed on what? Shahr Ramadan. It's not upon it. Except if you take what the meaning of the inward, of the Imams of spirituality, as an example, saying that Sahab bin Abdullah Tustari, saying that Sahab bin Abdullah Tustari, he said, in that night, Laylatul Qadr, in, in uh, Zalahu fi Laylatul Qadr, that we revealed on the night of the Grand Decree, the entire Quran, where? To the heart of the Prophet, وسلم, in its entirety, uh, it was revealed to the heart of the Prophet. وسلم. That's a different meaning, that Tustari radiallahu ta'ala and prefers. And that is congruent with the Quran that I where does Gabriel take the Quran from? In the outward, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, that Gabriel, over 23 years, is going to the angels of the first heaven. And that's when he brings Kalam Allah from the first heaven unto the Prophet Tanjima, Nujuma, in degrees. Others, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, he's the one who made Gabriel descend upon your heart. Ala qalbika, ya Muhammad. Descend upon your heart. Gabriel taking it, extracting it from the very heart of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama. But in terms of the first outward manifestation of the Quran, that engagement of Gabriel that we spoke about hadith in Sahih Bukhari, that is in the month of Rabi' al-Awwal. It's in the month of Rabi' al-Awwal that that first occurs, six months after the first descent of it. And between those six months is that is the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari of the dreams in the hadith al-Bukhari, which is in Kayfa Bada al-Wahi, how revelation begins also in Kitab al-Ta'biya, the, the chapter of dream interpretation in Sahih al-Bukhari, that for six months all the prophets are, that he, the experience of revelation was true dreams. Yet tika falaq subh Sayyidina Aisha says, that would be premonitions, they would manifest like the breaking, the breaking of the dawn in and of themselves, in and of themselves. So this is, month is very blessed. The month in which he was born, the month in which he was weaned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the month in which what? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi engages Gabriel upon earth, the month in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrives in the blessed space, Medina to Munawwara. Also the month in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam takes flight unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Month in which he takes flight. Okay, Rafiq al-A'la, Rafiq al-A'la. The blessedness of this month. It's a month in which people have traditionally held in great esteem, in great esteem. Okay, we ask Allah Ta'ala for tawfiq in that regard. Okay, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who makes hijrah, okay, and in, the, in the night, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being surrounded by whom? By the Quraysh, assassins, who have been sent to assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those assassins have been sent well, by Mela, the Mela of Quraysh, the Grand Assembly of Quraysh. Okay, that's how they're going to deal with the issue of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, they had different opinions initially. Their opinions was maybe we should just what? We should imprison him. Okay, imprison the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and just allow him to die ju'an. He'll die out of hunger. Other opinions that were raised in the Council of Quraysh was let's just deliver him to our enemies. Let's place him with our enemies and let our enemies deal with him. And none of them are going to be accepted. Why? Because of the presence of a foul being. Who is the foul being? The devil in and of himself. Satan. Who is present in the tradition. Sheikh al Najdi. He had assumed the form of a Sheikh from the Najd, the central plateaus of Arabia. He assumed the form and he entered into the great council of the Quraysh. 
which is strange because nobody gets into that council except that you're from Butun, Mecca, Butun, Quraysh, you're from one of the great 12 tribes of Quraysh. Nobody sits in that council. But somehow this Sheikh Najdi, this Najdi Sheikh, who is the devil in reality, had stepped into what? To give counsel, evil counsel unto the Quraysh. And one thing we know about the devil, that only on two occasions inside of the entire Sira do we see the devil manifest. One is here, one in, in, in Sheikh Najdi, in the, in the uh, assassination plot of the Prophet Sallallahu The second is pre-Badr, pre-Badr. He's of those who's going to try and encourage the Quraysh to go and face what? The army of the Prophet Sallallahu at the Battle of Badr. The only two times, which shows you the power of the Prophet Sallallahu read about the other Prophet, they engage the devil. Say the Isma Mariam has several engagements with the devil in and of himself. We don't have a single what we call the engagement of the Prophet Sallallahu and the devil. Okay? You see, because the Prophet Sallallahu is all vicar, all remembrance, Sallallahu Alaihi and the devil don't come near remembrance. If the Prophet Sallallahu is going to tell us, well, say, Umar ibn Khattab, Lo salaka Umar ibn Khattab, Fajja. We're Umar to travel down one nook and cranny, and the devil was coming on the same nook and cranny, the same road, La salaka Fajja, Ghayr Umar ibn Khattab. The devil would choose a different road. You wouldn't even want to encounter Umar ibn Khattab, the devil. If that's Umar, <laughs> But his plot, okay, his plot, which is going to be sanctioned by him, because everyone is refused by him. No, Laysa bi sawab, Laysa bi sawab. But he refutes everything until Abu Jahl Amr ibn Hisham, until he suggests that we just take a youth from every single one of the 12 tribes. Who has a dagger and they simultaneously assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He said, this is the opinion, this is the best opinion I've heard. And that's what they settled upon. So they sent assassins, these 12 assassins, to assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in his house. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who at that point is going to be given permission from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to migrate. And then the Prophet وسلم, he instructs Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, he, he says, take my Hadrami cloak, my green cloak from Hadramaut, and wrap yourself inside of that cloak. The Prophet وسلم, says, and nobody sleep in my bed, and no harm can walk and can come unto you. So we say Ali bin Abi Talib wa, that he, wa, he wraps himself inside of the green Hadrami cloak of the Prophet and thereby the Prophet through the recitation of Yasir exits, walks right out of the house while the assassins are all there, throws dust inside of their face and they all fall into a deep slumber and he walks right past them <coughs> after the break of dawn. And when they awaken and they ask, well, what are you waiting for? He said, we came to assassinate the Prophet and they said, she came to assassinate him. He's already left. They couldn't believe it. So when they entered the house and they removed the cloak, they see Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib and the, the fact that the Prophet Islam has already left. The first place he goes to is the house of whom? Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an. In the tradition, the Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an said there was not a single day in Mecca except the Prophet Islam would visit our house. Every day, what a blessed house that is. That every day the Prophet Islam goes to the house of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an. Ooh. And then when he goes to the house of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, this day was different because Aisha says that he comes in the heat of the day, heat of the day, Dhuhr time, and that the Prophet وسلم, is wearing a garment in, and covering his face, she says, anha, and then he says what? To Sayyidina Aisha, to, to Abu Bakr, an, that I've been commanded to make the Hijrah, to make the flight to Medina. And Abu Bakr, an, who's of the last people in Mecca, and he's told to remain in Mecca until he's given permission. Abu Bakr had been what? Rearing two camels. You see, in the hope that he'd be of those who would make hijrah alongside the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? And then he says to the Prophet ﷺ, Suhbah, Ya Rasulullah. Suhbah. And come your companionship. And the Prophet ﷺ says, the permission is being granted for yourself also. So Abu Bakr is going to make companionship by the instruction, permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of those who also waited for Sahaba, were saying to whom Suhaib, Ibn Sinan al Rumi, and Sayyidina Suhaib, of the great companions of the Prophet, had also been waiting in hope that he'd be of those who accompanied the Prophet. But this is the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And part of the reality of that decision is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will differentiate who Abu Bakr is in relation to the rest of the companions and the weakness of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an wa arda. And then eventually Sayyidina Suhaib is going to be of those who makes hijrah by himself. And he's aged, he's over 60, 70 years of age, Sayyidina Suhaib al Rumi, and he makes the entire hijrah journey by himself after permission wasn't granted for him to make hijrah alongside the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama. Other people are going to accompany the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama. From amongst them, Abdullah ibn Fuhayra, Amr ibn Fuhayra, these are two of the servants of the Prophet of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, and they save Abu Bakr, two brothers. They can be of those who make the hijrah alongside the Prophet Also another interesting individual whose name is Abdullah ibn Uraiqit. Abdullah ibn Uraiqit. So he makes hijrah likewise. What's interesting about Abdullah ibn Uraiqit? La yu'raf Islamuhu. It's never known he became Muslim. Never known he became Muslim. But he was obviously someone who had a high ethic. Because he had the Prophet is a hunted man. And he's gone alongside of somebody who's not characterized by faith. He's not a sahaba, he's not a believer, but the Prophet has a trust of him. And this is with Tejluba. A lot of times we hear about the great flight of the Prophet, one of the first flights, which was to where Ta'if, where he goes to the mountainous city of Ta'if and he remains for one month, okay, inside of Ta'if. Yadr al Thaqif al Islam. He's calling Banu Thaqif, the tribe of Thaqif, to Islam. When the Prophet Sallallahu message is not accepted by Thaqif, the Prophet Sallallahu leaves. Okay, when he, when he leaves Ta'if famous day, that's the worst day in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu which he said. When they asked him, was Uhud the worst day in your life? The Prophet Sallallahu said, no. He said, he said Daka yawm al-Faqif. That was the day of Faqif, the day of Ta'if. When he leaves Ta'if, where does the Prophet Sallallahu go? He goes back to Hira, to that great cave, Mount Hira. And he ascends the cave and he takes refuge inside of the cave of Hira. Alongside him is Sayyidina Zayd bin Haritha. And he tells Sayyidina Zayd bin Hadith, because he cannot, he cannot enter Mecca. The Prophet says that after the death of Abu Talib, he cannot enter Mecca. So the Prophet tells Sayyidina Zayd bin Haritha, go to Mecca and seek out Abdullah ibn Uraiqit. And ask Abdullah ibn Uraiqit to go and negotiate protection for me to, to re enter into Mecca. To which one? Abdullah ibn Uraiqit goes to several people, Sahil bin Amr and others, and one by one they all reject to protect the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Although what's interesting about the people the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi chose, they were people of great ethics. And for Muslim Suhail bin Amr, who's going to be the negotiator at Hudaybiyah, but he's chosen, but he rejects, saying, I don't have power in Mecca, I can't enforce it. So then, thereby, who do, do they go to? Mut'im. Okay, they go to Mut'im, and Mut'im is the one who's going to, as soon as he sees Abdullah ibn Raykin, and hears what the Prophet requires, he tells his sons, arm yourself. And they all arm themselves and they go to the Kaaba and they announce that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is under our protection. And it's war, it's war if what anybody's going to try and what prevent that. And that's how the Prophet re-enters Mecca. There's our first sort of engagement of Abdullah ibn Uraiqit, a person we don't know is Islam. And what's important about that is that it gives us a theme of what? Of just because somebody is not a Muslim, it doesn't mean he's wretched and evil. Okay? That there are people in the Quran who are called Ulul Baqiya. Those who, who, the last ones who remain from those who uphold the universal ethics that the human being was meant to uphold before becoming prophetic. You know, one of the great imams of the religion whose name is Al-Raqib al-Sahani. al sahani is one of the most influential people in the life and times of the great Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali was heavily interested by Al-Sahani, rahimahullah ta'ala. And Al-Sahani says a beautiful statement that before somebody must... So before somebody can become prophetic, he must first and foremost become human. Right? Before you can uphold the prophetic values, the prophetic virtues, you've got to first and foremost uphold base human universal values that are shared between all of man. Okay? And a lot of times we forget that. And that's one, one of the reasons why we don't attain the rank of prophecy, I mean of those who imitate prophecy, of those who adhere to the prophetic way. You see, because we issue priorities like a Tahawi rahimahullah ta'ala says, yani al awwaliyat, yani, yani, the, the, the luzum, or yani, the adherence to priorities being part of what our understanding of this great tradition. So the related is of those who's going to be alongside the Prophet sallallahu when they make the hijrah. First and foremost, he's going to go to Thawr, the great 
cave of Thor. And again, the strange thing of him going to Thor is that Thor is in the direction of the Yemen. It's south of the Kaaba. And the Prophet was headed north. But he goes south, and this is part of the stratagem of the Prophet وسلم, Never did he go to engage an enemy ever, وسلم, except he goes in the opposite direction. Okay, it's part of his stratagem, وسلم, when he says war is stratagem, الحرب الخدار, he says, وسلم, and he takes refuge inside of what inside of Thawr, okay, with the great Abu Bakr as Siddiq, with the son of one of the sons of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, young sons, he's going to be on reconnaissance. Okay, in the daytime we were in Mecca, listening to the words of Quraysh who sent trackers, bounty hunters, to hunt the Prophet Okay, and then in the nighttime he goes to the cave, to the Prophet and he will inform the Prophet of what, what, what are the words of the Quraysh of Uttaran, where they are. Okay, then likewise also Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr she's called, the one who has the two straps, Asma, the great, great Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, the mother of Abdullah bin Zubair. That say that Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha, she's the one who's taken supplies to the Prophet Sallallahu and her father by herself, by herself. And we know that she is what? Like seven months pregnant at this point in time with the great Abdullah bin Zubair. And on one occasion when she's got the food, she has nothing to what? To, to, to tie the food with, to tie the food, to take to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she takes off a belt. The women of those days used to wear a belt, a mid belt, and she would take off her belt and she ripped it into two. That's why she's called Bet and Nitaqain, the one of the two straps. Why? Because one of those straps saved the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for The greatness of Asma, remember, she's pregnant and she's going to and fro, to and fro from forward by herself. And then when the Prophet eventually takes flight from forward, she then by herself heads to what Medina? By herself. And when she arrives at Quba, Asma, she gives birth to Abdullah bin Zubair. He is the first child born in Medina to Munawwara. Abdullah bin Zubair, the great Caliph, the great Khilaf, in, in person of Khilaf, the great Sahaba. Okay, so the Prophet Sahaba was tracked eventually, which again is amazing about the knowledge of the Arabs, how they track the vastness of that desert, could have went in any direction. And Abu Jahal, has highest, the, the, considered the greatest tracker in Arabia, can track anything in the desert. And what's amazing, he tracks the Prophet Abu Bakr right to the cave in Thor. I mean, that in and of itself is amazing how he got to that cave. And then he what? Then he says, Khalas, they're here. <laughs> Abu Jahal looks, Abu, he looks at the, what, the cave and he sees what? He sees the spider's web spun over the cave. He sees a bird. Okay, nest of a bear, bear with his young ones. And he says, you want me to believe he's inside of here? That's what you want me to believe? And the tracker says, I don't make mistakes. I mean, I do not make mistakes. I've tracked them, he's right here. Abu Jahal says, yeah, what do you think I am? Because Abu Jahal is known as Abu Hakam. That's his name in Mecca. We know him as Abu Jahal, because the Prophet named him that. But his name is Abu Hakam, yani the father of wisdom. You see, the wise one, the erudite one. I said, do you think, do you think I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to go for it? And he's here. And he says he's here. So he said, I'll show you. So he goes to try and enter the cave. And Abu Jahal begins to stop him. I'm not stupid. He's not here. And Abu Bakr says, Ya Rasulullah, Were they just to look at their feet, they will see us? That's how close they were. And, and the Prophet tells Abu Bakr, he says, what do you say about two who Allah is the third? Oh. I mean, don't fear, Allah is with us. I mean, the Prophet says it was cool, calm, and collected. And Abu Bakr becomes cool, calm, and collected based upon what? The aura that the Prophet says is dispersing into him. <laughs> and Abu Bakr, Abu Jahl begins to uh, protect the Prophet Again, that's again one of our teachers said, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah Ta'ala, he takes the enemy and he uses them as a protector for the Prophet He's trying to, the, the tracker trying to enter the cave and Abu Jahl's fighting with him. <laughs> oh, I ain't that stupid. You know, no, 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 we're going, he's not here. And there's the Prophet Okay, so when they leave, then they take what? They take the, the, the path, the untrodden path to Medina to Manawara. The untrodden path, okay? They're going to take over one month 
and because there's no track to Medina, Medina is usually two weeks from Mecca, but the Prophet travels off the beaten off the beaten track all the way to Medina to Manawara. Okay, because trackers are going to be sent, bounty hunters, killers. Okay, who see, sage people down and take people's lives for a ransom. Quraysh have placed a ransom upon the life of the Prophet, dead or alive. And the most famous of them is Suraqah ibn Malik. He's the most famous of the trackers, Suraqah ibn Malik. That he tracks the Prophet in the midst of the desert. But again, look at the reality. In the midst of the desert, he tracks the Prophet Okay? And when he finds the Prophet the Prophet and his, the companions who are with him, saying Abu Bakr and others mentioned, are moving forth. And Abu Bakr turns and tells the Prophet Adrakana, that the Saraq ibn Malik has reached us. And the Prophet raises his hand, he doesn't even turn around, raises his hands to Allah Ta'ala, and then the earth opens up and swallows Saraq ibn Malik, swallows him to the horse. And then Saraq ibn Malik begins to shout to the Prophet Al Aman, Al Aman, safety, safety, protect me, protect me, don't hurt me, and give me security. So the Prophet raises his hands again and the earth throws the horse out. And then Surah Kuna Malik goes again for the Prophet. He's a bounty hunter. And the Prophet raises his hands again. He goes down into the earth again. And he shouts, shouting, Al Aman, Al Aman, Al Aman. The Prophet prays. He doesn't even turn around, Sahih Ali Wasallam. The Sahib, the, 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 the bearer of peripheral vision, 360 degree vision, he's a turn around. He sees everything as in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim. In case people think this is some type of funny stuff we're discussing here. Okay? So then he kicks him out of the air. And Suraka goes for the third time. And then Khalaf from praise. And then he's swallowed up in the air. And at that point he says, that's it, a man. I understand. Pray for me of this situation. So the Prophet Sallallahu prays. And then he comes out of what? He comes, he's kicked out of the air. Suraka al Malik. And then he says, to go in further, he says to the Prophet and write me, I want a contract that I'm not going to be harmed. I mean, I want this in writing. That's what he asked for the Prophet So the Prophet commands Amr ibn Fuhaira. Amr ibn Fuhaira, the, 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 one of the same as Abu Bakr, he's the one, he writes a contract to Surah ibn Malik. And then the Prophet tells him, dunya, you're chasing dunya. That's what it's about, dunya, for it's going to pay you to take my life. The Prophet says to Surah ibn Malik, How will it be, ya Suraqa? How will it be upon the day when you wear the jewels of Kisra? When you wear the crown jewels of Asia? How will it be on that day? And Surah ibn Malik, he says, What? Well, yeah, he put that in the contract. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wear that. And doesn't become Muslim. Khalas. He leaves. And then, but look, what, why am I saying doesn't become Muslim? Because then in the tradition, Surah ibn Malik then patrols. The desert, and when he meets the other bounty hunters, no, they're not in that direction, they're not. As a disbeliever, he protects the Prophet This is Qudrat al-Bahari, this is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's sent to kill, and he's transformed into a protector. Uh, Abu Jahl, despite himself, goes to kill, sent, transformed into a protector. This is Qudrat Allah, the power of Allah ta'ala, in Africa, that has been demonstrated, penetrating upon the face of the earth. Okay? And then we know the famous story of Surah Ibn Malik, that what? Fat, Fat Mecca. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sends the great armies. After the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, sent the great armies, Sayyidina Ikram ibn Jahad, Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn, 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 ibn Malik, Ibn Abi Waqqas. He is the one who goes and conquers what? Qadisiyah conquers Persia. Persia falls. Okay? The jewels of Persia are sent to Umar ibn Khattab in Medina, the Caliph. Suraqa <laughs> hears of this, he becomes Muslim, Fat Mecca. Fat Mecca, Suraqa al Malik, that bounty hunter, becomes Muslim. Then he goes unto whom? Unto Sayyidina Umar ibn al Khattab. And he said, He's got the letter. Eh? He waved the letter that the Prophet said, Ya Suraqa, how will it be on the day when you wear the crown jewels of Persia? Hat. Give me what? Give me the, give me the jewels. So Umar ibn al Khattab, look at Umar, gives him the jewels. Khalas. Qala Rasul, Qala Rasul. Awesome said that he said it. There's the jewels and there's Suraka, you see, sporting the crown jewels of Persia. Eh? And then Umar ibn Khattab says, now give me them back. He says, Qala Rasul. The Prophet Sallallahu said what he said, said Suraka. And Umar says, he said you could wear them, not keep them. <laughs> you want to 
to be precise about the way to the messenger. He said, you can wear them, not keep them. Give me the jewels back. And I'm going to take the jewels of Suraqa ibn Malik. Uh, okay, so this is what the Hijrah. And then we're going to see a famous tradition, okay, which is the tradition of Umm Abad al Khuza'iyah. Okay, Umm Abad al Khuza'iyah, she's going to be this Bedouin woman from the tribe of Khuza'ah, who lives in the midst of the desert between Mecca and Medina. And what's going to be important about this beautiful woman is that she is the first one to describe the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like our first description will be considered like in the chapters of Shama'il, that of the description, the facial description of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's by Umm Ma'bad. That's why it's a very, very famous tradition. And the Prophet descends upon her. And she's so eloquent, so beautiful in the way he describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how his care and nature for his companions, how he was held in great respect for his companions, about the nature of his facial features, and how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with animals, and how he was considerate for me, and even considerate for a husband who was not present, okay, and how he dealt with the animal who gave no milk until the animal engaged the Prophet ﷺ. You see, the cow would give anything to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, as we see throughout his life. An animal that can't give will give when the Prophet ﷺ is the one who's asking, okay? And then it's going to be the great arrival in Medina to Munawwara. The great arrival in Medina to Munawwara. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he brings forth a very interesting one moment. The first people to see the Prophet ﷺ approaching Medina to Munawwara is going to be whom? The Jews, the Yahud. So the Jews are on a hutum, they're on like some type of like elevation. One of the Jews, and he's gazing and he sees the Prophet ﷺ approaching. Opinions is the great later Sahaba, who's Abdullah ibn Salam, because he reports the tradition about the first words the Prophet says when he enters into Medina. Other opinions is not what Abdullah ibn Salam, the first one to see the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, the question, because sometimes we, we overlook these traditions, because surely in those days and age, in that day and age, everybody would know what the Prophet ﷺ looked like, right? Well, wrong. You know, it's not the age of what, of the f- transfer, trans. Uh, the movement of information, transfer of information at high speed. It's not the age of internet. It's not the age of Twitter and Facebook and CNN or whatever the means we are for communicating things across great distances. In Medina, they do not know what the Prophet looks like, but the Jews do. And how is that that the Jews know? What, how come they see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam coming and say, this is what, here's the one you've been waiting for. This is the one he's arriving. How do they know what he looks like? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, that's important. For one, it could be anybody arriving. I mean, it's time of Hijrah. Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab himself, when he left the Hijrah, he took 20 Sahaba with him. Why, why would they say this is the one arriving then? But it's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrives. Here is the one who's arriving. And to make sure that's the only meaning we understand from this occasion is that when the Prophet arrives at Medina and they hear he's arrived, he's arrived, the Ansar, Arabs, not the Jews, the Ansar, they come out and they all run towards the Prophet and jump on Abu Bakr. <laughs> they think Abu Bakr is the Prophet, they don't recognize the message, they don't know what he looks like. So they all think Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr is like, this is the messenger, yeah, or Rasul, yani, what are you doing? So where do the Jews get this from? Allah Ta'ala says they know him just like they know their own children. Described in the Torah, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. That's the type of precise knowledge they had about what the action, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi look, and they could easily refer to. Okay? And the first visitation, no doubt, is Quba. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arriving at Quba. The great sort of city of Quba, which was then a separate territory to Medina, as a tradition, the Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Salam relates as they, as they enter, they're going to be, begin singing, Qala al badalu alayna, that the Badr, the full moon, has appeared in front of us, has risen over us, whichever way you translate it. Okay, the Badr in the Arabic language is the most beautiful metaphor, is the, is the greatest metaphor struck for beauty, for Lughat al Arab, for the Arabs. You want to say somebody is beautiful, you compare them to the full moon. And that's who the Prophet has said, Qita, you know, they would say. He was like a piece of the moon. And in the Mu'atr of Imam Malik, one of the Sahaba, he says, That I gazed at the Prophet on a night of the full moon. I looked at the Prophet and then I looked at the moon. 
Then I looked at the Prophet and I looked at the moon. Then I looked at the Prophet and I looked at the moon. And there he was more beautiful than the full moon. In the water of Malik. Okay, that's the greatest metaphor stroke for beauty. That's why they're saying, the full moon has has appeared in front of us, has risen over us, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And that's the children of Medina. And what becomes the normative way for the children of Medina, it is as if never does the Prophet وسلم, arrive at Medina, we're going to see throughout Medina, except it's the children who were the first to greet him. The children always were anticipating when would the Rasul return, when would the Rasul return. Every day there are people on watch out, and when they hear that the Prophet is coming, the children will be warned and they all go to the outskirts of Medina. And then the Prophet will stand there and he will shout to the children that the first one to reach me gets a prize. Look at the Sallallahu He may be coming from war, he may be coming from greater duties, but look how he is with the children. The first one to reach me gets a prize. So the children all begin to race towards the messenger and they're all in flight and they all jump upon the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The beauty of how he, be, how he behaved with them. In the tradition, there's a gateway to paradise, one of the gateways of Jannah. It's known as Farah. It's called the gateway of happiness, Farah. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, that gateway has been reserved for people who make children happy. <laughs> that gateway is only for those who bring happiness, joy to the hearts of children. The Prophet Sallallahu said about that great gateway. We ask Allah Ta'ala to render us from them. Ala qadam al-sidq, ala qadam al-rasul. Following the Prophet Sallallahu with utmost sincerity. Okay, so when he enters what Quba, the great city of Quba, in the hadith of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Salam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi first and foremost, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, he says, Afshu Salam, first with Afshu Salam, spread peace. So Abdullah ibn, ibn, ibn Salam, the Jewish rabbi who later becomes Muslim, says the first words the Prophet Sallallahu said on arrival at Quba is Afshu Salam, spread peace. Okay. And although, why is this important? Because the theme of Medina is war. But the first words of Medina is peace, spread peace. And what that gives us is an understanding of war inside of our tradition. That war is about bringing about a state of peace. Okay? That's all it's about. Okay? And you can only understand that if you understand the greater war scheme of Arabia. The Arabia, which was wild, wild warriors, wild, killing one ton, to the point that the great superpowers of the world would never enter into Arabia. The, the Romans don't enter into Arabia. Even when they engage the armies of prophecy, they're outside Arabia. They don't enter into what, beneath the, the deserts of the Levant. It's always beyond the deserts because Arabia was wild. Persians don't enter. They just make deals with the Bahrainis. They have vice regents inside the war, inside of, um, Arabia to do their bidding. Abyssinians only get into lower parts of Yemen for 20 years, and then they're kicked out in the, in the year that Abdul Muttalib dies. Arabia is untouchable by the superpowers because it's wild. Wild killers, wild. And when the Prophet makes flight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, peace. You don't hear a single sword clanging inside of Arabia. That people have to understand what he did. He brought a place that nobody could tame, and he tamed the entire what? Jazirat al Arab, the entire island of the Arabs. And inside, how long? Something that is what has not been matched, bearded, nor will ever be matched. Okay? The greatness of the Messenger. He says, Feed food, feed the hungry. The Prophet said, he said, maintain ties of kinship. He said, pray whilst people are sleeping. And you will enter paradise in peace. Four things he told the believers to be those people of peace, to spread peace. Okay? To be those who understand their duties inside of society by looking after the vulnerable and those who are marginalized and those who have been what? Who have been denied basic rights. To be of those who all understand their rights that have to be delivered towards their kinfolk and the family. Even the Prophet said in the hadith of Makarim Akhlaq in Sahih Muslim, where he says that he says that from the signs of akhlaq, of, of, of great virtues, is that, that you tasil men wa qata'ak. You maintain ties with those who break them. Go against the norm, the Prophet said in the hadith of Ali bin Abi Talib. 
So that's what the duty towards family, the word about the duty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu wa nasunniya. Pray whilst people are sleeping. Tadkhuluna jannah bis salam. Are you lent at what? Paradise in what? In peace. And then the Prophet in conclusion, he thereby what? Takes what? The arduous journey two weeks later. He stays two weeks inside of Quba. And then he what? He heads towards Medina to Munawwara, the city of Medina, the enlightened city. And the Prophet وسلم, he ate the beauty of it. Because Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib all the way back in Mecca, who's left God in the house of the Prophet وسلم, And the last way to the Prophet Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib was Ruddul Amanat ila Ahliha. That all of these war trusts that the people have given me, take them back to their people, their rightful owners, and he gives name by name, this is Fulans, that's Fulans, that's Fulans, every single one. Which, as I said, what's strange about that? But wasn't he an enemy? I mean, the believers virtually are all in Medina, so who is all of those amanat? And the violent is disbelievers. Disbelievers trust in the one they want to kill. It's crazy, huh? That they saw him as the most truthful, trustful man alive, such that they would place their own possessions inside of his hands. Sallallahu alayhi wa but still, they couldn't well fathom the fact that Allah Ta'ala had given them a greater trust over and above their own possessions, which was the trust of the heavens. This is the supreme bearer of the heavenly secret, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And thereafter, he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he goes towards Medina to Munawwara, and Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, who now, after he's retained all of the amanat, heads to Medina by himself. He's making hijrah by himself, Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. He doesn't know what awaits him. Because as Sayyidina Ali approaches Medina, there's the Rasul. Uh -huh. And he meets up with the Rasul, and he's of those who enters into Medina alongside the Prophet Sallallahu This is a tawfiq for the great Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. And when the Prophet Sallallahu enters into Medina to Munawwara, that's a great occasion. And all of the various tribes of what of Medina, the various houses of the Ansar, okay, the Jews, they're all there to greet the Prophet Sallallahu And every single one of them want to take what the Prophet Sallallahu and have him to live inside of their house. And the Prophet Sallallahu was riding the beast Qaswa, Qaswa. That's the camel, his name's Qaswa. That camel, the Abu Bakr read. Abu Bakr read two camels, Qaswa. And Qaswa, he said, this is for you, Ya Rasul. And he said, Suhba, Suhba. The Prophet said, yes, you've been granted. And he said, I've been preparing this, this one I prepared earlier. He says, Qaswa. And then the Prophet Sallallahu says, Nithaman, what's the price? He said, it's a gift. Ya Rasulullah, he said, no gift. I, this occasion, it's on, it's on me. And then they argue, quote unquote, and Abu Bakr recedes. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi pays Abu Bakr for Qaswa. That's the great beast, that's the greatest beast of prophecy. There's no beast that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rode that is greater than Qaswa. Qaswa means the fame-footed one, fame camel, the fame one. And it's the only beast reported in the tradition that whenever revelation descended upon the Prophet he wouldn't book, she wouldn't buckle. She said Qaswa, that the, the best they would do to Qaswa is that if she would chew it, she would <laughs> just stop, but she would not buckle. Every other beast, when revelation descends upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, says, we will thrust the heavy weight onto you, they will buckle every beast of prophecy, except Qaswa. I mean, great beast, that's the one at, at Hudaybiyah, when they're heading towards Hudaybiyah, Prophet on Qaswa, then Qaswa on this occasion, buckles. And the Sahaba begin to grab Qaswa, trying to move Qaswa, but she's fair footed, she won't move. And they start shouting, Qaswa's being stubborn, she's being stubborn. And the Prophet ﷺ says, that's an attribute she does not know. <laughs> I, this, this is a camel of virtue, of, of akhlaq. And, she, and then the Prophet ﷺ said, but what has buckled Qaswa is what buckled the elephants of Abraha, all of sacred territory, of the Haram of Mecca, the awe of the Kaaba. When Qaswa got in the vicinity of the Kaaba, she buckles out of all of the territory she's about to approach. SubhanAllah. When last did we buckle approach in Mecca? When last did we buckle approach in the Haram? When last did we buckle when we get to the Kaaba in and of itself? And even if we don't buckle physically, did our hearts even buckle? Do our, do our hearts go into a state of fear and trepidation when we approach sacred and blessed territory? Okay, there are people like Al-Bura'i. Al, 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 Al 
They were one of the great imams of Medina, that every time they would, they, uh, imams of Islam, every time they would take al-Bur'i to Medina, he'd get to the outskirts of Medina, and he would fall unconscious. Allah. Then they would, the imam, the great imam, they would take al-Bur'i, and they would what? He's unconscious, couldn't come to. They would carry him away from Medina, he would come to, he'd wake up. Then they would bring him back to Medina. <clears throat> outskirts couldn't get inside of the city, and it's just to and fro. Till eventually Allah Ta'ala gives him the strength that al burai is able to enter into, into Medina to Manawara. And he enters, when he gets to the shubak of the Prophet Sallallahu he dies. Allah, Allah. What type of people? These are Imams from our religion, yani, what type of hearts were those? And they're there as a standard, as a measurement for our hearts. Especially in days of distance, days of veils, days of veils of darkness. That we cannot penetrate due to the filth that we have. We ask Allah Ta'ala for purification. And then they begin to try and take the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet says beautiful words, Da'ha, leave Qaswa alone. They're all trying to drag Qaswa, Hadith al Bukhari. He says, Da'ha, leave Qaswa. Innaha ma'mura. She's under command. She knows what she's doing. And then Qaswa is walking through Medina. And then Qaswa comes to a war. She comes to a graveyard of Mushrikeen in Bukhari, a graveyard where the idolaters are buried, and she buckles. And when Qaswa looks, Qaswa doesn't alight Qaswa. Qaswa looks, buckles, then she stands up again, and she begins to walk. And then she walks, and then she buckles once again. And then what? The person stays upon Qaswa, and then what? Qaswa stands up a second time. Then she goes back to the first place that she buckles, and then she buckles finally. And then the Prophet says, Hadihilmanzila inshaAllah ta'ala. This is the abode, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, where does she buckle twice? In the same place? That's the masjid. It's a graveyard of the Mushrikeen and the Bukhari. That's how it is. Okay? That's where she buckles first time. It's a signal. This is the house, this is the house of the Prophet. She stands and she goes to the second place. Where is that? The house of Abu Ayyub al Ansari. That's when she buckles the second time. I, she's showing the messenger, this is your temporary abode until we build your house. Then she stands and goes back to the same place. And what did she show the Prophet Sallallahu Different ways to look at it. One, this is the masjid, same place. And two, this is your abode in the Barzakh. Ah, your abode in the intermediary realm where you're going to reside. Okay, in the intermediary realm after death. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahihi wa sallam. And the Prophet said, This is the menzila, this is the abode, inshaAllah ta'ala. We ask Allah ta'ala to make us from people of niyyah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who want to do khidmat al rasul, who intend the messenger, intend the messenger for service. In this time when people of Allah obtain their back upon the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sahihi wa sallam. In jahiliya, there was a man who, when he heard that the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam was going to live in what? In Medina, in Yathrib. He heard this, words of the Jews, and then the man said, if he's going to live in Yathrib, I'm going to build the house in which he lives in. Tell me. So he builds a house inside of Yathrib for the Prophet Sallallahu to live in. He lives and dies, he doesn't meet the Prophet Sallallahu Children live and die, don't meet the Prophet Sallallahu Grandchildren don't meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi The house is eventually sold. It's sold to a family from the house of Najjar. From the house of the Ansar, the Prophet said the best house of the Ansar is the house of Abu Najjar. Who is that man? Khalid al-Ansari. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. He buys the house, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, mashallah, is his customer come right to his doorstep. And the Prophet is going to stay inside the house of say Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. Yeah, was it for Abu Ayyub? Or was it for the intention of that man in Jahiliyyah who just wanted to save the Prophet ﷺ? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala renders us khuddam, abid al ihsan, Allah ta'ala places us in his servitude and allows us to be of those who excel in the servitude of He subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as the Rasul. InshaAllah, does anyone have any questions? <coughs> Any questions? Just a uh, question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there were 124,000 engagements between uh, the angels, uh, the drivers, uh, and professors. So are these 
in the, in the physical presence or the total? Total. I, how many times did Allah, the Prophet, uh, say that Jibreel meet the Prophet وسلم, upon the earth or in the heavens or combined 124,000 times it's reported? Yeah. That's in the, in, the, in the physical life of, of um, 63 years. Yeah, 63 yeah. years. Yeah. Actually, what were the name of the two brothers that were with? Abdullah and Amir, the sons of Fuhaira. Fuhaira, Abdullah ibn Fuhaira, Amir ibn Fuhaira. Actually, the female bedroom is that described the patient as well. Um Ma'bad, the mother of Ma'bad. Um Ma'bad, Al Khuzaiya, Um Ma'bad Al Khuzaiya. You mentioned um, Waraka, and you mentioned uh, an of his state or condition when you described him. Um, what was the description that you gave him? Regards to what? In terms of, you know, even though he was a Muslim, he was a Christian. Um, he was a man of ethics. What was the description that you, you gave people like him? Do you call the Hunafa? These are people who, who talk to monotheism before the outward manifestation of the Prophet. I be pre 40 years of age, the Prophet. That's what I mean, saying the Warqa. Was he a Muslim? We don't know. Did he become Muslim or not? We don't know. Every indication is that he's of those who embraced and believed in the Prophet Sallallahu But did he formally become a Muslim? There's nothing reported about that. But the ulama would explain that in two ways. The first is, nor did he have to. Because this is pre prepared When a Prophet is a Prophet, he's not commanded to call to the religion. It's only when he becomes a Rasul, which is after the death of Warakat, is he commanded to call. So anyone who becomes a Muslim prior to that time, it's all good for them. But anyone who does it, it's not necessarily against them during that period of time, between Nubuwa and Risala. And then the second, it doesn't matter anyway, the Prophet told us he saw him in paradise. So, yeah. That's definitive about Sayyidina Wa'ala Khaybun Nubu Fala. Any questions? Sisters, any questions? Yes, sister how were the Khalifas chosen? How were the Khalifas chosen? They were chosen in different ways. As Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, that there are multiple traditions that, that, that point to him being the first caliph, although that's not necessarily that what the Sahaba went upon. So he was elected by various elements of the Muhajirun, i.e. the Sahaba, who came from Mecca, from most of Umar ibn Khattab, and say that, um, um, Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, and then also he was elected by what the Ansar who were present, okay? For most of the people who were present, they say that Sa'ad ibn Ubaidah, Regardless of whether he was one of those who elected him or not, he was present at the, at the election of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So the first is by the election of the Sahaba, okay, and this is on the day that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi passed, same day, that's how important the affair of Khilaf it was. As for the second Caliph, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Umar is going to be elected by the appointment of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is the one who appoints Umar ibn al-Khattab. In his last days, Abu Bakr specifies Umar is the next Caliph. And saying Sahaba may have an issue with it, that's, that's Warak. And they asked saying Abu Bakr, how are you going to face Allah Ta'ala on the day of judgment? <laughs> you're, you're, you're appointing the most harsh man from amongst us to be our leader. And Abu Bakr said, I will face Allah knowing that I've appointed the best man from amongst you to be your leader. Okay, and that's Umar ibn Khattab second. As for the, the third caliph, Uthman ibn Affan, he's appointed by whom? By um, the Council of Seven. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, upon his death, he, t- he takes over 10 days, he's stabbed mortally, assassinated, but it takes over 10 days for Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab to die. Over 10 days. So he when he would he stab so many times, when he'd drink milk, it would come out of him. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, 10 days it took for him to die, radiallahu ta'ala. An. But in that time, Umar ibn Khattab is only thinking about the affairs of the Ummah. How to rearrange the affairs of the Ummah. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab used to say, in, when I'm in prayer, I organize armies <laughs> in Salah. I arrange the affairs of the Ummah whilst I'm in prayer. So Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab arranges the affairs of the Ummah. He, he elects seven people in order to choose the next Caliph. And he, he, six can be chosen, can choose and can be chosen. And only one can choose but cannot be chosen. That's his son Abdullah ibn Umar 
He's from the council, but he cannot be chosen as the caliph. When they asked Sayyidina Umar, appoint Abdullah as the next caliph, he said, it's enough on the Yom of Qiyamah, one of the sons of Al-Khattab will answer for this affair. He didn't want anybody else, Khalas, no. So he wouldn't allow his son to be chosen for the caliph. So the, the six are all going to choose, eventually the seven are all going to choose Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman is going to be chosen, the arbitrators after Rahman ibn Auf, and then what? Uthman is going to be chosen. But once he's chosen by that council, then what do they have to do? They have to have it corroborated by who we call the wal Aqad, who the, the greater council of the Sahaba, I all the Sahaba of Medina, and they corroborate the choice for Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. And then on the assassination of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, it's Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. The assassins try to elect Sayyidina Ali, the Egyptians, the assassins. And what Sayyidina Ali says, it's not in your hands, it's in the hands of Al-Hani wal Aqab. It's only the notables of Medina who have the power to bind and unbind. That's what Al-Hani wal Aqab means. Those the power brokers who have those who have the power to bind and unbind. It's only whom they have the power. So then when they went to the, the Sahaba of Medina, they elected Sayyidina, whom Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib as the fourth caliph. Questions, inshallah. Okay, you know, so for the whole journey from Makkah to Medina, is it then five? Prophet Yeah, being the five. Yeah, the whole way, yeah, the five. No. Any questions, inshallah, Ta'ala?